Is it true that science can tell us nothing about how to live, what to do, or how to be a good person? I don't think so. At their core, moral statements are truths about us. They are thoughts and feelings which we as human beings possess. Morals are ultimately judgments, justifications, which take place within the human mind. All moral philosophers use such tools as thought experiments, analogies, and demonstrations to make their points. This carries through right from Plato to Peter Singer. Indeed, it's very hard for me to imagine a system of philosophy that doesn't rely on these sorts of tools. However, if this can be done by one person, it can be done by many. If we can begin to see moral judgments, behaviors, justifications as things requiring statistical analysis, if we take them and apply them to larger groups and use that sort of research method and analysis, then at that point we are doing science. It's often said that one story is an anecdote, but many stories, that's data. If morality is so important to us, then why leave it in the hands of anecdotes rather than at the hands of science, in the hands of data? By taking this perspective years ago, moral psychologists have discovered many interesting things. Much like how philosophers such as Descartes, Hume, and Berkeley made egregious errors by assuming that the vision system, or our sensations, were designed perfectly, so too moral philosophers have often made egregious errors by looking at morality as a perfectly coherent and logical system, rather than as an evolved system. Our moral system, like our vision system, was evolved to tackle certain tasks and perform certain functions. Also like our vision system, it contains elements of development, creates moral illusions, and has a phylogenetic evolutionary history. In the next few videos, I'm going to do a search over some of these areas and make the case that moral psychology, and thus science, has something relevant to say about morality. Let's start with evolution and comparative biology, and demonstrate that morality is, at very least, a biological system. I found this video showing capuchin monkeys demonstrating beliefs in fairness and justice. If this seems rudimentary to you, then it is. But you have to remind yourself that capuchins and humans had their latest common ancestor 35 million years ago. A pot of hazelnuts and the flint that's needed to open the lid. You need both to get a nut, but they're separated by a see-through barrier. Vulcan has the rock, but can't reach the nuts. Virgil has the nuts, but knows he can't eat them without a rock. Vulcan quickly offers the tool. He must hope Virgil is smart enough to open the lid and fair enough to cut him in on the spoils. Virgil is struggling. He doesn't have his friend's skill. And Vulcan is getting impatient. The flint is finally through the lid, but can Virgil be trusted to share the nuts? With Vulcan out of reach, it must be tempting to take the lot. Three nuts, a fair share. 
Vulcan and Virgil have used teamwork to beat the system. But can Capuchins really have a sense of fair play? In that last video, there were many different interpretations that someone could make about the behavior that was demonstrated. For instance, we could say that the monkey only was able to trade or felt the need to trade because they feared being beaten up when they got back into the cage later. However, at the same time, that too demonstrates a sort of understanding of expectations of fairness and of a very rudimentary basic principle that evolution would be able to grapple onto and change over millions of years. I see no reason to think that that sort of behavior could not have developed into the type of philanthropy, charity, and good moral philosophy that we have now. Let's look at another video and see a, a more clear example of this idea of fairness being demonstrated in the capuchin. Ted gives Vulcan a white chip which can be exchanged for food, in this case a dried biscuit. An identical token for Virgil, but in return he gets a juicy grape, a far better exchange. Virgil is back for seconds, but this time Vulcan sees him get the grape. He now expects one too. Biscuit? That's not fair. Virgil's back again. Another grape. Vulcan is losing his composure. This injustice is too much. He was happy with Biscuit, but that was before Virgil got grapes. Now he'd sooner have nothing than be shortchanged. It's a point of principle. Virgil returns, so Vulcan suspects Ted of readying another grape. It must be in there somewhere. At last, a succulent grape. Anyone who would doubt that morality in some sense came from these types of behaviors then has very little idea of the type of behavior that was just witnessed. When Vulcan returned and started to pry open the hands of, of Ted the experimenter, we saw not only a sort of frustration at this unfairness, but also pieces of theory of mind, the ability to predict the behavior of another being by associating it with sort of rational thinking faculties. If nothing else, then we see that type of demonstration going into a clear ability to know another thoughts, have expectations about them, and then to model our behavior according to those expectations. That, I think, at very least, shows an evolutionary history of morality.